The first, uh, you all will have to play, pay particular close attention to this next part because it gets a little complicated. Now, in 1965, Liza Minnelli won a Tony for Flora the Red Menace. In 1972, she won an Oscar for the movie Cabaret, which was, of course, two years earlier, uh, a, a musical for the Broadway stage, which won a Tony. Now, just hold on. Now, in, 19, in 1973, she had the nerve to win an Emmy for her performance in uh, Eliza with a Z. Now, this girl is very good if you dig talent. <laughs> now, tonight, she is a Tony nominee for her electrifying performance in the act. Here's why. Hello. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome to After the Bows. After the Bows. Very exciting. This episode, we are throwing out the script just like Bobby did last week. Hey, no. We're breaking all the rules. That's right. This week, we're going to be furthering our conversation on Flora the Red Menace, uh, which was the subject of the last episode of the My Favorite Flop podcast. In case you didn't know. They're related. There's a little logo up there. Uh, by discussing the career and life of Miss Liza Minnelli. This show really launched her into superstardom. And even though it flopped, uh, it was the beginning of more things to come. And uh, she, she has been nothing but an inspiration to the both of us, right? Right. And so the next best thing to getting Liza on the show, which we really tried, we, we promise. Tried. Well, uh, we figured we'd bring on some other people. So without further ado, welcome to the After the Bow stage. Us! The two of us! We're going to talk about Liza! I mean, I think this absolutely makes sense, Christina, because as we discussed in the Floor of the Red Menace episode, when I met you, I was like, oh, kind of like Liza. So it... But I'm not the only person in your life who've compared you. Not like to say you are exactly the same, but you have no. similar energy, right? Yes. It's been an ongoing no, thing. Been, it's been an on-running theme in my career. But that being said, Liza is incredible because of who she is and what she's accomplished. So let's start at the beginning, shall we? Yeah. At the very so, beginning. At the very beginning. Start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Okay, that's it. That's all I'm going to do. Um, so, obviously, Liza Minnelli had very famous parents, Judy Garland. And Vincente Minnelli. Yes. And uh, so she grew up in this business. And she grew up at a time when the studios really owned you. And uh, she grew up with other kids whose parents were super famous. So everyone was just super famous and that was just what it was. And that was just life, right? Um, and it's in interviews with some of her peers from that time, they all said, you know, they would take dance class and they would like hang out together. But Liza was very serious. She was in ballet class and she was working those plies and those tondus, man. She wanted it. She wanted it more than anyone else she grew up with. Um, and uh, when Judy and, and Vincent Minnelli split, uh, she ended up moving around a lot. And she talks about how when she was moving around and going to new high schools, you know, every few months, she was very quiet as a kid. And so every, every time she was in a new school, she had to find a new way to survive is the way that she was saying it. Cause as we all know, high school's rough for anyone, let alone a famous kid, let alone having to like change schools all the time. <laughs> um, and towards the end of her high school career, she actually landed herself at the High School for Performing Arts in, in New York City, which so many amazing, wonderful, talented humans have come out of. And there's this amazing story that she tells and Marvin Hamlish also tells it because they went to high school together. Funny story. Um, where she was really down. She was like, I'm not going to make it like, this isn't going to be, my dreams won't come true. This isn't going to happen for me. Right. And so they're on the subway and they're having this conversation 
and uh, Marvin Hamlish and someone she calls Bobby. And I think it's Robert De Niro because I'm pretty sure they also went to high school at the same time together um, are on the in the train car. And <laughs> they're like, we're going to make her feel better. So they start singing, you'll be swell. You'll be great. You're going to have the whole world on the plate. And they're like dancing up and down this. <laughs> the subway car and then she said from that moment on she knew she could never spit in the eye of fate again and that yeah, was it. that's crazy her entire spirit animal changed in that moment which i absolutely love so we kind of mentioned this on the podcast how she was like i want to do this and her parents were like cool go figure it out we're not gonna help <laughs> <laughs> like she did she went and she started out by doing regional stuff and she got she right, almost right out the gate landed louisa and the fantastics tour with elliot gould i oh, mean yeah. <laughs> i had no idea he played el gallo but that completely makes sense that's insane um, it is insane and you can actually there's some stuff on youtube guys which we'll post on the on the website so you can go listen to her be louisa which is pretty spectacular but right. from there she ended up moving on into recording because at the time if you were a broadway star you also were a famous recording artist so she tried out her first um album right bobby yeah so she started in stock and i love I love the story of when Liza talks about how she was inspired to go down the theater journey. Cause like yep. you said, she was a dancer. She saw Bye Bye Birdie and she didn't want to play Kim McAfee. Like I'm sure every other girl in the audience, she wanted to like do the telephone hour with everybody else. The telephone hour is spectacular. I do not blame her. Like she wanted to be in the ensemble of that show, but the ensemble is not where she would live. Like yep. you said, she did stock uh, and she recorded these albums on Capitol records. Um, uh, there were a couple of them actually recorded before she even made her Broadway bow in Florida, the red menace, uh, her second studio album. It amazes me, uh, had a lot of pop standardy material. Uh, Capitol really wanted to give her an opportunity, uh, to make her way and the pop music charts, like so many people who had been on Broadway in the fifties and sixties had done. Um, but it was like we said in the podcast, right around that time when, um, pop stars stopped being birthed from the Broadway stage, right? Right. So yeah. her album didn't chart. Her pop standard album, you know, it wasn't the hugest success, but um, people really enjoyed it. Uh, and she ended up doing Flora, 1965. Um, yes. As we mentioned, uh, the show Wait, opened. Let's talk about this for a second, right? She's 18 when she does Flora. But right. before that is when she's recording her first pop album. Like, right. and had already done the tour of the fantastics like yeah what? <laughs> and and the fun fact that i found out yesterday because i was watching judy garland interviews from before she passed away uh and you know trying to find tidbits of like what her mother thought of her daughter's like superstardom and a fun little fact that i don't think a lot of people know is before she booked flora she was actually cast as barbara streisand's understudy in the original broadway cast of funny girl and the only reason she didn't do it is because they're like yeah she's not gonna understudy we're gonna put her in a star we're writing her a show so she can't understudy you so sorry 19 19 <laughs> like 16. it's pretty crazy i mean you can tell right out the gate that she's just got talent and she's got that it factor that you can't teach right oh gosh absolutely yeah absolutely um, and flora gets her her first tony win first nomination first win to date the youngest woman to win a best actress uh at the tony awards nobody younger has won that award younger people have won in the other acting categories but nobody right. has officially won competitively to beat liza minnelli's record which is kind of cool that is cool. I mean, there's not as many opportunities for young leading ladies, are there? No. Well, you know, there's the Annies that come about and they did sure. give Tony Awards to the Matildas, but they gave them honorary Tonys because they didn't want them to have to compete. In the Again, category. the adults, yeah. which is interesting because they made the Billies compete. And they won. Just saying. Just saying. Broadway League. Just saying. Okay. Back to Liza. 
<laughs> Back to Liza. <laughs> Back to Liza. So after she does Flora, she wins her Tony, right? And then later that year, because Flora didn't last very long, right? So later that year, she's in London and she's doing this crazy live concert series with her mom. With right. Judy, right? Which ends up becoming an album itself and like charts on the Billboard pop charts, which is crazy. And some amazing stuff is done. I mean. In that in that show. I mean, I never, like growing up when I was introduced to Liza, I never really associated her with Judy. They seem so different to me. Right. But watching this, you see, you see how, how Liza came from Judy, right? Like you, oh. talent wise, obviously she came from, you know what I'm saying. Physically came from Judy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but talent wise, like <laughs> you, you really start to see the similarities in a good way. Oh, absolutely. And but no differences. And copy, right? But differences as well, right? Oh, totally. And I think that she takes her mom by surprise at a couple of these moments. I've seen some footage and you, <laughs> Liza will start singing, right? And then all of a sudden Judy goes. Right. It's <laughs> so good. It's so good. But what a high compliment. I mean, we all want to impress our parents, right? Especially like uh, daughters to mothers. We really want our moms to be proud of us. And we, especially when we idolize our moms and their talent, we want them to feel that way and to surprise your mom like that. I mean, that's, that had to have been a wonderful feeling a little oh. jarring probably um, on a stage with like thousands of people in the audience and them like televising it. But <laughs> that was kind of the norm for her life. So I'm sure that didn't feel that weird. So, yeah. I mean, I think she made a joke at one point. Uh, I read this the other day that um, she was born and then, you know, there was a reporter right there taking a picture like the minute she was born, you know, so she was no, no stranger to the camera and to the limelight uh, was there from day one. And that must that must be something that really affects a young performer in in all kinds of ways, right? Oh, sure. To not have to not know anything else. That it's almost scarier what life would be like without those things. I'm I bet. Yeah, I mean, look, when you grow up and she apparently was Ron Howard's babysitter at some point. Okay. Hey, like right. <laughs> when that's the norm, but like you're just kids in Hollywood and you have friends and you play outside and I'm sure you have sleepovers and things like that. Yeah. It's probably super foreign to people like you and me, Christina, but it probably in a lot of ways felt super normal. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about how, when they would used to have like big barbecue parties with everybody on the block. Right. They would have, um, you know, the kids section, then the nannies. <laughs> right. And then the parents. And she said when you would walk past the nanny table, that you would hear them passing comment on their parents' latest film. And be like, well, she wasn't as good. She wasn't the last one. So, you know, like, we'll see what happens. They may drop her. <laughs> it's just like the nannies. I mean. The nannies have these kinds of opinions, but that's the world she grew up in. So she she doesn't know anything else, right? Right. And that has to, I don't know, in some ways it may be good, right? If you're if you are lucky enough to be like Liza and really be able to show off your talents by the time you get to that place where everybody knows who you are and you have reporters there and right. it feeling normal probably helps a little bit, right? Right. It doesn't feel so jarring because it's what you've always known. Right. Well, and Judy grew up as a very normal, you know, lower income person in in the country. So even though uh, they had this extravagant MGM laughs lifestyle, I imagine that she would have instilled and would have said things, you know, uh, to her kids to be like, smoke and mirrors, this isn't real, what we have is real. And you get a sense from interviews with people like Liza and Lorna um, about yeah. their relationship with their mother that she really tried to give them a semblance of normalcy because at the yeah. end of the day they were this family unit you know what i mean separate from exactly all yeah all right so well, back to palladium yeah oh well so after she does this palladium thing then she gets an abc tv musical special and this one is a lot of fun because it's gone viral there's one song 
that Liza performs in it. It's called The Dangerous Christmas of, of Red Riding Hood. And it was written by Bob Merrill and Julie Stein. Uh, it's one of their two Christmas specials they wrote. One of them is still quite famous. It's a cult film. Uh, it's the Mr. Magoo Christmas. People love the Mr. Mr. Magoo. Mr. Magoo Christmas. It's a cult favorite because it's aired so many times. But this is the other one they wrote for Liza. Uh, Cyril Richard, who is Captain Hook in the Mary Martin Peter Pan, right. plays the big bad wolf in this. Uh, Perfect cast. It's perfect casting. There is this viral video of her singing this song called like ring a ding, ring a ding, ring a ding. I feel so Christmassy. And it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. And that, yes, every year or so it goes viral on the internet, but there's lots of other fantastic moments in it. But to think she's got this Tony and then ABC, like we think of, you know, when um, Carrie Underwood stars in the sound of music live, right. you know, these are big events. Mary Martin in Peter Pan was a big event. Right. Liza Minnelli. And I want to play this up because you're about to give a tidbit that comes right after this. It's just, it, it speaks so much to Liza, but also is crazy. She does yeah. this thing. It is the most watched program on television that night. It is the wow. highest rated program. They never aired it again, which is crazy. So. Well, and back then, remember friends, now we can find everything, right? Like we can Streaming. stream anything. Right. If you are not there at 6 p.m. turning on the television, you miss it, period. And you so miss- the fact that that many people were like, I'm I'm here with my TV dinner. I'm here. I'm watching it. I got it. Right. I got I to gotta see Judy's kid. Got to see it. That's what <laughs> I got to see it. Um, and yeah. And she performs at the Oscars after that. Like, so she's on this ramp up for like next stardom, right? Like next level. Next and level. And the next thing she does even later that year in the summer, she's like, you know what? I'm just going to go and I'm going to go play babe in pajama game at a bunch of summer stocks. Like not even an official national tour. Like no, just <laughs> summer stock. And I'm not laughing. I, she, no. That's how much she wanted to work. She was a workhorse. She loves, she loves what she does. Right. And it, someone's going to give her an opportunity to get on stage and have a good time. She's going to do it. And the pajama game is the funnest time. Like, yeah, I mean, babe in the pajama game is a lot of fun. Um, I, you know, I don't think that, uh, babe gets enough credit in the world of classic musicals. Well, and another one that like, I wouldn't necessarily go, you know, Liza's babe, but (laughs) now that I think about it, I'm like, she is absolutely babe. Kelly O'Hara who like, come on. Oh no. Liza's got so much sass and spunk. But she also has this ability to um, bring nostalgia almost into her work, right? Right. And so having those kinds of levels for something like Babe is going to really level it up. Right. Right? Really round out a character like Babe. Um, And then at this point, she's also like desperately desperately trying to become the Sally, the Sally in Cabaret. So she's auditioning for the Broadway show because this is pre the movie, right? So she's auditioning for the Broadway show like 20 times. And this is after she's worked with Kendra and Ebba Bunch. And Hal Prince. He produced for the... (laughs) She's like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get Roxy. I'm going to get it. Bob, put me on the show. Right? Like she wants it so bad. And she went and just kept auditioning. And I think this speaks volumes to her work ethic right. and to who she is as a as a worker. Right. Because so many people, you know, they're like, I'm off her only. Well, especially after a right? Tony Award. She yeah. has a Tony 20 times. She's like, Nope, not taking no for an answer. Not taking no for an answer. You will see me. You will see me for this part. And let me tell you, I feel you, Liza. I have done the same thing with Sally. <laughs> I have knocked down doors. I have yelled at people. Right. I have made phone calls. I get it. I am with you. <laughs> but she doesn't end up booking it, which is, no. really, I'm sure, really sad for her. But she doesn't stop there. Like, she keeps trying. She, she keeps trying. The songs and her shows. Oh, yeah. So she releases her third studio album, which also fails to chart. This one's super interesting because this is when they try to start giving her pop songs. Like Sonny Bono wrote songs on this album. She starts appearing on, you know, she's always been appearing on these talk shows for several years now. But you see her start performing like 
Frank Mills from Hair. And you start seeing her do these like legitimate pop songs. Mm -hmm. And people are like, "Mm, I don't know if we get it. But like you said, she starts incorporating the cabaret material into these TV performances. So Jill Hayworth might be doing it on Broadway and Judi Dench might be doing it in the West End. Liza's doing it on national television. (laughs) Smart girl. Yeah. Smart girl. He's like, you will see me as Sally. Sally Bowles. Um, but yeah, she starts performing the songs. She also starts performing Maybe This Time, which wasn't in Cabaret yet, but she became right. quite known for her performances of it, which you'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but then she's like, I really want to get serious about movies. You know, her mother's a big movie star. Her dad is a famous film director. Uh, and um, she she read this book called The Sterile Cuckoo uh, that she really liked. And she told her father, you know, if they ever make a movie of this, I really would like to star as as Pookie, the the, the female lead in this. Right. And uh, her and her mother were like, okay, I don't know if they're going to make this into a movie. Uh, but then they announced it. And she said to her dad, she's like, can you get me an audition? And he actually knew uh, the people working on the film. Um, I think he invited them to the house and was like, hey, the kid wants to do it. And she... <laughs> and she got it and not only did she get it which this movie is if you've never seen it you need to see it because it's really ahead of its time like it's not of the age that it came out of no and this is like a movie that i could imagine if it had been made you know five six years ago like an emma stone or a daisy ridley starring in like this is this is a young quirky slightly insane person and there's a famous five minute scene on a phone call where you see Liza just completely break down on this phone call with her partner in the film and a lot of people feel it's that one scene that got her her first Oscar nomination for the show Cuckoo. I'm not I am not surprised because it is rare that you have any on camera where the director will just allow a one shot, like just a single stilled one shot for five minutes on the same character with no one else in the shot. It is, it is a masterclass in acting. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And the thing is, is every woman, no matter what generation you are from, understands that moment. Oh gosh. It's heartbreaking. It is. It's heartbreaking. And it, it's not about her being insane, right? Like, I know that that's kind of the premise of the film where she, she goes a little cuckoo, but right. that moment is genuine and it has nothing to do with mental illness. It has everything to do with just wanting to be loved by the man you love. And when, cause she's playing, she's playing a co-ed, right? She's in college mm-hmm. in the film. And when you're that young, that <laughs> that's everything, right? Young love is the most tormented. Um, and she really embodies that and makes it grounded. And um, she's so aware of what that story is and what that feeling is. Oh, and the director her gave her... The director gave her so much to work with, too. I love the choice to make uh, the gentleman who plays her love interest in it. He just speaks in nothing but this monotone. Mm -hmm. Like his responses are so soulless that you, not only is Liza's performance amazing, but the two of them back to back, it's like, it is gut wrenching to watch. And like you said, there are other plot points that go places, but in this moment, it's she's, she's reacting to a really awful person to her. Like he's being awful to her. And awful. it's genuine. Awful. Awful. First, Absolutely awful. First Academy Award nomination. Yeah. Number but one. I will say, when I was watching that clip, she, this is going to be like completely out of left field, but have you watched Star Trek Discovery? No, I know you're a Trekkie. No, because I'm the nerd in, the, in this duo, aren't I? Um, but anyways, for those of you who watch Star Trek Discovery, <laughs> she reminds me of uh, Blue De- Blasio, I believe is how you say their name. Uh, They're non-binary actor, but they are so reminiscent of this version of young Liza. Oh, wow. I mean, it's, it's uncanny. It it really is. And for those of you who know, know the actor I'm talking about, please comment because 
oh my goodness. I have it, to watch it now. Yeah. Now, well, I mean, you probably won't like it, but <laughs> go, go look her up uh, or okay. look them up on, um, on IMDb and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Right. But anyway, so she gets her first Oscar nom, BAFTA nom and Golden Globe nom for the cuckoo, the sterile cuckoo. It's a big thing. Well, that's a lot, right? A lot. Now, Eliza, Liza obviously has a very addictive personality to work, right? right? She is a workhorse. She comes from that age where you just say yes, because why not? There's no she's, reason not to, she right? She sings a song about that too. Yeah, <laughs> just say yes. Um, and it's just like, if anyone has uh, learned anything about Elton John over the last couple of years, especially with the movie that's come out and his recent autobiography, which is absolutely stunning. Um, but he's the same way. He just kept writing because that's what he knew. He was a session musician, right? And that's just what you do. You just keep working because they love it. They right. have such a love for it. It doesn't matter where or what or how they're doing something. They show up and they do the job. And I have so much admiration for that. And I would like to think I'm the same way. Um, even okay. if ever I, you know, had stardom to them. Um, it's fine. I, I um, think you're a workhorse in, in, in the exact, I don't say that as a negative thing. I think in the very similar way, I would yeah. say that about you. Yeah. And I, and I love that. I think there's, there's something really special about that way of working. Right. Um, so after all of this, we finally get Cabaret! The movie! We land it! Liza lands it and she says it's mine I'm going to do the work I'm going to figure it out I'm going to do what you want me to do take and, that Jill Hayworth oh no it, here look it's not that, that that role doesn't belong to one person right? right but she wanted it and she made it happen and you have to respect that now I remember watching this movie when I was a kid and my dad introduced it to me because when, right, when when I was younger, I really only knew Golden Age musicals, right? And right. this was like the first edgy musical I was ever introduced to. Um, and my dad said to me, he's like, when this movie came out, when this show came out, it challenged everything for right. the general audience, right? We talk about how um fiddler on the roof kind of really changed the face of contemporary musical theater with changing what expectations were not having a happy ending it's not necessarily a musical comedy all of those things but it's pretty it's still pretty traditional in terms of subject matter and you know how far they go with certain things mm -hmm. right and then you have something like cabaret which talks about things that are not okay to talk about in public mm -hmm. that allow a woman to talk about her body and embrace her body and embrace her sexuality and all of these things, as well as openly talking about, you know, the dreaded a word, right. And what that means and what it means to have the choice, the choice to choose what you do in that situation, right? And that, and the fact that it became so popular and in, was embraced by the general public is a big deal. It was a big turning point for film. It was a big turning point for theater, art in general, because it was no longer, you know, the random random play over here in the small theater that not everybody sees you know, or the artsy indie film, it was in your face, mainstream, we're going to talk about this. We're going to have the conversation. Um, and that is, <laughs> to me, that means that everything's different, right? Well, it's not only the A word, but the N word. So it's like they wrote this little musical about communism didn't work out so they're like well we're gonna throw nazis at you yeah so not only that but um in the original version of the stage version stage show they don't do this but in the movie you know cliff his sexuality which for a movie in 19 mainstream film 1975 
to deal with the A word, to deal with Nazis, and then to have your leading man question, dabble with his sexuality. I mean, he's essentially bisexual in the movie. Huge. This is huge. Yeah. And lots of different communities. Like lots of different communities. Um, and it's it's in my opinion, it's one of the most important pieces of work. In oh yeah. Here. Um, and I it I think it's why so many of us want to be a part of it in some way. Right. Oh, yeah. When I got to do it, I I mean it was it was everything to right. me. And I wasn't like I was not Sally, I was in the, I was one of the Kit Kat girls when I did it the first time. And that getting to play the gorilla, I didn't realize like what that would, <laughs> I know <laughs> it's actually one of my pride and joys getting to play the gorilla. I didn't really understand what it meant until we were working it. And it became so important to me that I had the opportunity to be a part of that in some small way. Right. Right. Um, and it, you, you see in this film, why Liza wins everything, everything, everything. And what I love is that Liza grew up dancing, right? Like she grew up dancing, but she's not necessarily someone you think of as the dancer, right? Like she doesn't have your atypical dancer body, right? right? It's not... She's got long legs, which is great, but she's not like ballerina body. And she is why she works so well with Bob Fosse because he loves an odd bean. And that's what she is. And what I love is she embraces her body and the way it moves no matter what. Right. It tells a story no matter what. Right. And you really get to see that in this film. And I, I absolutely love it. She talks about it later in life. She's like, I watch it and I'm very confused as to how I got my leg up on that chair, but then I'm like twisted around. I don't even know. <laughs> Just like, I understand. I understand that life. But yeah, so she wins the Oscar. She wins the Golden Globe. And then she does Liza with a Z. Beast on my heart. This is like... I mean, this is, this is, they claim it's the first real live television for concert. I mean, I don't know concert for television. Oh, like, okay. Like, I, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Built specifically as this live event. Like it wasn't a pre-existing thing. I don't know. It is, it is just, it's everything and you're talking about it. So go. No, it's okay. We both need to talk about this one because okay. we both absolutely love it. I mean, we all know my personal favorite is Ring Them Bells. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Well, and I love you. You talk about how she moves her body and how Fosse. I think there were, that I read something where I guess Liza has scoliosis and oh. Bob Fosse noticed it right away when he met her. And he said, it wasn't like, dang, how are we going to deal with the scoliosis? He said, great. How can I use that? And my favorite moment in all of Liza with the Z from a dance perspective is I gotcha, which is, to me, it sounds like it could be on the radio. So Liza, I think in Liza with the Z, gets pretty close to being a pop star. Yeah. She does this song with these two, I would call them pimps. I don't know. <laughs> and she's in this like, it's like a plastic orange dress, pinkish orange dress. Yeah, it's the same one she wears and ring them bells. Yeah, she is moving. It is so crazy because this is when she starts to become known as a sex icon, you know? Right. She is in... But she literally looks like she's dancing in her living room and nobody can see. Nobody can see. And the crazier she gets, I swear to you, the more people are into it. Like, oh, yeah, continue. Well, Sorry. That's well, just my little. No, it's because she she has no inhibitions about it. And she's just like telling, like, she's just like doing it. And like, it's just going. And I'm like, gosh, to be that relaxed, like every actor, it doesn't matter if you're a dancer, you're a singer or whatever. As an actor, you are told you have to be relaxed, right? To like fully tap in and like be comfortable in all of the things. And Liza lives in relaxation. And yeah. I'm jealous. I am just jealous. Cause she like just does like bang, 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 and it looks normal. Well, and she's looks and then she's so cool. <laughs> she's so relaxed that she's making funny faces at the audience too. Yeah. So like she is like so like. I got this, whatever. I'm also going to like, 
I'm going to comment on this and just be like, I'm going to make this even stupider. And you're going to oh think I'm God. really hot. I know like, moment right before she goes off stage. In that number? Yeah. When she's like, <laughs> oh, yes. And then just walks off. <laughs> so good. But there's so many great moments in this, this concert. Like, so many. Oh, my gosh. And the thing I love about what Liza does with her concerts, with her cabarets, is that she tells a story. It's not just her getting up and singing a bunch of songs that people want to hear her sing. Right. I mean, that's definitely part of it. But she's like, okay, if I'm going to do this, how do we make it a story? What's the story we're telling? Why do we do these songs? Why do we do these numbers? Um, and that is something that I, I have a lot of admiration for and something that I strive to do with every cabaret that I put together right is that I need to tell a story so that doesn't mean I sing the song that everyone wants to hear I find the music and the the pieces that tell the story that I'm trying to tell right, right. um and I and I love that about how she works with her concerts and it's definitely unique I, not everybody does that um and she does it with such ease. I mean, I guess it helps when you have people like Kander and I'm just like writing you music for your cabaret. I mean. But. <laughs> so I if mean. Uh, any composers want to help me out, you let me know. <laughs> Looking for them. Oh, my goodness. So she does this, right? And she wins. She wins an Emmy for this. So I think the same year as Chicago. So she wins her Oscar, her BAFTA. Cabaret. Her Golden Globe. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> she <laughs> got to Chicago again. <laughs> next cabaret she wins all these awards and she wins the emmy for eliza with the z it's huge um and she goes off into concert land but then in 1975 you know bob fossey her buddy now they're buddies they bobby bobby she calls him bobby that's why when you were saying the bobby i'm like is it fossey no they didn't go to high school together no i think it's robert de niro I think I think it is. based on the like research i was doing i believe it's robert de niro i'm not right i'm i'm pretty positive as well but she calls bob fossey bobby as well they're working on chicago and gwen gets sick gwen verdon gets sick Ugh. and they're like what are we gonna do and they call up liza friend friendy friend to friendy. fossey gwen john kander and fred ebb and they're like hey can you do this and she learns the role in two days christina two days she learns the role she only agrees to do it being like, I don't, I don't want to make a big deal about me in the show. This is Gwen's baby. Just announce it before the curtain. So there's no, there's no big like announcement in the times. She's not on the marquee reportedly at her first performance. They're like, ladies and gentlemen, we said this in the podcast, but at tonight's performance, the role of Roxy Hart will be played by and everyone groans. And it's like Liza Minnelli and people are just losing their crap. She, does Roxy for however long, several weeks, I think, uh, while Gwen's out of the show, just two days rehearsal. No big deal. Like, I love it. Uh, uh, no big deal. So she does this. It's great. She leaves. Gwen Verdon goes back into it. It's like, okay, bye. Uh, and she does some other movies. Probably her biggest movie of this next period of time is New York, New York, right? right. Speaking of De Niro. Um, De Niro, which she may have gone to high school with. We're, we're believing that that's the case. She she gets cast in this movie with Robert De Niro, directed by Martin Scorsese, which uh, wasn't the biggest hit at the box office, but it really gave Liza her signature song. Um, New yeah. York, New York, which I know a lot of people are like, wait, that's Frank Sinatra's song. It's written for Liza Minnelli. It's written for Liza. Um, in fact, it was written for Liza at the suggestion of Robert De Niro, because they had written another song for that moment of the film that Robert wow. De Niro hated and was like, you guys need to write something different than that. And oh, apparently there you go. that I did not know. Yeah. So apparently Kander and Neb were like, oh yeah, well, we'll write a song. New York, New York. So <laughs> Kander and Neb don't have that kind of personality. <laughs> uh no, but they do challenges. Like, um, you were there because we we did that thing on on stage that you were in the oh, audience. Guys, if do you, you can find these videos? Do it; they're so good. Um, that story about how uh, they were basically dared to write a song in 15 minutes, and it ended right. up being "I Don't Care Much" from Cabaret. That like <laughs> 15 minutes. Just casual. 
take a challenge. So uh, she she gets a Golden Globe nomination for New York, New York. Uh, she doesn't win, but she does get nominated for a Golden Globe. Um, and then she heads back to Broadway because Martin Scorsese is so taken with Liza. He's like, you do that Broadway thing, right? Let's let's go let's go do that Broadway thing together. Oh. And he directs her in this show that's called Shine It On originally, and it's this book musical. And by the end, when it gets to Broadway, it's essentially a Liza Minnelli concert that kind of has scenes in between the songs. It does have uh, a through line. It, no, there is a plot. There is a plot. It just became more of a like a concept musical. It's like her her club act with the scenes in between. Right. Um, right. But there are some iconic Liza songs in that as well. She won a Tony for this. Like, um, yeah. oh, what are some great songs in the act? Arthur in the Afternoon. Arthur in the Afternoon is everything in my life. Um, <laughs> City Lights. <laughs> it's so good. I love it. Um, but then you also have City Lights, which talking about that concert. Oh, my gosh. Heidi Blankenstaff. Oh, she like rewrote that song. Well, it's completely different when Heidi did it. And it was stunning. One of the best performances I think I've ever seen. Right. And I I fell in love with Heidi that night. I mean, I'd seen her do a couple of things, but that right. night I was like, Heidi. be my friend. Just I mean, yeah, friend. it's it's a fabulous song. And I imagine the way Heidi did it is the way they wrote it for Liza. They right. just decided to pop it up for the show. A lot of the songs in the act have that 70s kind of pop feel to them. Yeah. But when you hear them outside the act, you're like, oh, it's Kander and Ev, you know? Oh, it's like, different. Yeah. So yeah, she won a Tony for it. Now, uh, what happens next? I've got two Tony's friends. Two. 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 Ridiculous. And then she goes and does Arthur. The movie. Not a musical. Not, Not a, a musical. musical. She doesn't even sing in it. No. Just being an actor and being awesome. She gets Golden Globe nom for that. Um, and Arthur is just such a fantastic film. Dudley Moore. Ridiculous. The and they have Arthur too as well. So she ends up doing both of them. Right. Yes. And then she does Liza in concert, which is a world tour. And I actually, I have a friend in that. <laughs> Jamie Torsellini. If Jamie you ever Torsalini. listen to this, I'm giving you a shout out. Um, he was one of her dancers and absolutely fabulous. Um, but yes, they did that. And Bobby's favorite song is on that. Cause just like she did for the cabaret movie, she was like, I am going to play Mama Rose. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, it's happening. Well, it's like a turning point because she goes away from performing a lot of her younger material mm -hmm. and she starts going into more material, more mature material. And, you know, everyone's got a favorite Mama Rose. Uh, mine is very fractured. It depends on the actress for each song. So right. for some people, nobody can match, I think, Liza's rendition of the song from this tour. It is... It's electrifying. It really is. And not, and it's not done in the expected way no. by any means. She's wearing that, like, it, I'm going to call it the Jersey Boys dress because that's what it looks like. Yes. You know, the white dress that all the girls come out in at the end. Um, and she just, again, that relaxation in her body where she's just like flinging herself and it's so genuine and grounded that you don't question it. It, you just don't. You're like, yeah, that's she, normal. When she's like, I'm going to get out. And she's like, ah, 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 ah. And yeah. she turns her back to the, you're like, what is going on here? Yeah. This is a woman who is going to make her children famous. Come heck or high water. Yeah. And it's so good. I don't know. It's, it's so good. It's so good. It was, I think you're right. I think it might be the best. And I, I saw Patty do it on Broadway. Right. And fell in love with the show when I saw it. Mostly because Laura Bonatti as Gypsy Rosalie is chest breathy. I mean. But here we are. Um, but yes, some people in that performance was absurd. It's 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 real good. And sadly, Gypsy was not on Broadway in the early 80s and they weren't making movie musicals. You know, it's interesting, you know, in the 80s, she's maturing as an actress and Broadway, we've talked about this on the podcast, American musicals are kind of taking a dump on Broadway yeah. and we're not really making movies in Hollywood and she's a, she's a movie star. Yeah. So she's like, what the heck do I do now? There were movie musicals in development, believe it or not, her couple weeks stint in Chicago got her like permanently attached to the movie version of, of 
the, the play. Oh, Chicago, yeah. Yeah, as Roxy. And her and Goldie Hawn actually had been cast officially in the 80s. And um, to drum up excitement for it, in 1980, her and Goldie did a show called, it was a TV special called Goldie and Liza Together, which is one of the most absurd things that ever. number. <laughs> In the cars, like, and especially because like, like, like Goldie is driving a Jeep and she's in California. Liza's in London for some reason. And she is yeah. in this old timey, like model a and and you're like, what? Gorgeous. It's a gorgeous car, but you're like, what is going on here? Well, and I think they're, they do is they're trying to show their two personalities, right? Like, of course, Goldie Hawn has an open air Jeep. Of course right. she does. Why wouldn't she? Of course, Liza drives an old timey car in London. Yeah. It's no, big no it is. What I loved is when they pull up on the CBS lot and I sat there and I was like, okay, this is an opportunity lost. I'm going to need James Corden to get Goldie Hawn and Liza Minnelli back. And we're going to have to reenact this. Crosswalk the musical. Crosswalk the musical. I mean, it's there. It's written for him. James Corden. James. Do it. <laughs> uh, well, she wins an Emmy. Oh, well, she gets nominated for an Emmy for this one. Right, right, right. Um, they don't make the Chicago film. She gets attached to the Evita film. They spend six figures doing a screen test on her with Ken Russell, who was directing it. They spend six figures. They they fly her out to London. They film scenes from the movie with her done up as Ava Perone. Right. And then the director gets fired and doesn't get paid for 15 more years. So obviously she ages out, but yeah. lost opportunity. Well, the, the pictures you found, the rehearsal shots and the spec shots, Holy cow, it doesn't look like her. Like you know it's her because of her eyes, but like that's that's really it. I, she looks completely different the way she's holding herself, like her stature and the, yeah. I would kill for wh whoever has that screen test. I really just need to hear her, don't cry for me, Argentina. I just- You know that's what they did for the screen test. Yeah. and. Okay. In all of this, she also has time to do the rink. No big deal. No big deal. No, no big, big deal. deal. She Color does the lights, let's go. The the rink with uh, Cheetah and gets another Tony nomination for it. She doesn't win this one though. No, she so she's only got the two. Only got the two. She wins, right? But at this point, we have an Emmy, a Golden Globe, and a Tony, right? And an Oscar. And an Oscar. And a BAFTA. Right, and a BAFTA. But that doesn't count in this. Thing that we love to call an EGOT. An EGOT. An EGOT. And guess what? She got the Grammy when she did the Pet Shop Boys album. Which, right. if you ever go and listen to that, it really sounds like Cher. Like, I feel like I'm listening to a Cher album, which is unexpected. <laughs> well, yeah. It's... Don't associate the two of them together. <laughs> They're probably friends, too. Oh, uh, I just I, mean, I imagine. Time. Their BFF. Uh, it's it's a it, she had she had tried the pop thing before. This is like full blown pop songs. These are yeah. pop songs. Pop songs. But then she throws a wrench into it and is like, "But I'm also gonna do "Losing My Mind" by Stephen Sondheim as a pop song, an '80s pop song. Honestly, it works. I mean, and she dances the crap out of that Grammy performance. Yes, she does. Like yes, she does. In her 40s, too. Yeah. So now she's an EGOT. And, like, yeah. not a not a casual, like, oh, I kind of got it because of lifetime. No. Woman won an EGOT. Yep. She got and a real in, one. In some of them, like, multiple times. Like, <laughs> crazy town. So then she goes and does Liza at Radio City Music Hall, which wins her an Emmy nomination because, again, it's another televised concert. And I absolutely love her stepping out oh my gosh performance in this because that woman brings on every w dancer of a certain age and certain body type and they are all on stage there's like 20 of them and they tap their little patoots off oh my gosh it's like watching 42nd street all over again absolutely stunning and then she introduces every single one of them by name in the middle of the show so they can then take a standing o bow yes it is one of the most selfless acts that i think i can like ridiculously crazy big celebrity has ever done yeah that. it is it is amazing i i sat there and i was like this is this is how you use your visibility 
to create space for equity and inclusion, right? Like that's what that was because you had BIPOC as well, like across the board. Um, and those women could tap their faces off. Of course you can, right? Absolutely. It doesn't matter what you look like. If you're a good tapper, you were in the number. Right. And it was, it was so much fun to watch. Um, so she goes from this and then she goes back to Broadway, right? Back to Broadway, gets a phone call. So her buddy, just her friend, Julie Andrews, uh, is having some vocal problems while working on Victor Victoria. Uh, and she needs to step out of the show for a bit. But everybody knows Judy, Julie Andrews is the, you know, um, the draw. It's it's what people are buying tickets for. So she calls up Liza and is like, I think, I think you might be good for this. Could you step in for me? And she's like, let me, let me, let me dust off, let me dust off my, my, my sequins and comes back to Broadway in the nineties. Uh, I don't know if she learned this one in two days, but uh, she stepped in and not only that, they wrote her new material. They're like, okay, well let's really tailor it for Liza. So she got some new songs right. and uh, was fierce and fabulous and doesn't try to do what Julie Andrews did in the role. Completely different performance. Completely hey, different. You know what we were talking about. I don't think we said it. Victor Victoria. Oh yes. Victor Victoria. <laughs> If I didn't say it, oh my goodness. I don't think we did. Uh, oh my goodness. It's very You're exciting. Fans, right? You're all super fans. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, she does Victor Victoria, which is such a fascinating role. And I bet she was just, I'm because uh, Julie Andrews in it is surprising, right? And she's brilliant in the film. I love the film. And so I, I'd be interested if it's a similar situation where, Liza is surprising in the role. Yeah, I imagine. I mean, the role is really tailor made for Liza. You know, I think mm -hmm. that that the, the the theme of what the, the show talks about and a lot of the material, range wise, I think it's a different place than maybe where Julie Andrews saying it. So that I think may have been a surprising thing. But uh, I think we buy the idea of Liza being this performer in pair I don't know it kind of speaks to her sensibilities doesn't it it totally does I, it does but it's uh there's there's this other kind it's like the Avita thing like she would have to hold herself differently in a different it's not her normal Liza right right it's like a different it's a different embodiment of a character but she goes from this and then she goes and becomes a tv star oh yes arrested development hi yeah. which is crazy because a, you know, she had done TV like guests about appearances and had done a lot of TV appearances on talk shows and things like that. Uh, she gets a call because they needed a Lucille too. Uh, I love Arrested Development. I know it's not Christina's most favorite thing on the planet, um, but it has its cult group of fans. I happen to be one of them. Yeah. Uh, but for Lucille too, you know, they had been working on this show, which Ron Howard was one of the producers of. Uh, and they're Hello, like... He said her. Well, th that's the eventual connection. They write this role for for Lucille too, and they're like, "Who are you imagining?" They're like, "Oh, we would love to get someone like Liza Minnelli." And Ron Howard's like, "Oh, let me give her a call. She used to be my babysitter." And he's like, "Hey, Liza, do you want to be on a TV show?" And she's like, "I've always wanted to do that." And so she's Lucille too, and she is brilliant on the show. The relationship she has with um, oh gosh, what's his name who plays Buster? You don't watch the show. He was also on Veep. Um, did you, you're, are you a Veep fan? Uh, I don't have HBO. Tony, Tony Hale, Tony Hale, who ah, is in all, okay. all the things yeah. now, the two of them, cause they're romantically involved with each other, kind of, sort of, no. um, yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. Uh, she's brilliant in it. I don't think she was nominated for any awards for it. Other than I think they did at least once get nominated for one of those ensemble Emmy, right. Emmys for the, for the piece. Um, but Yeah people love her in that. Like it's a big surprise. Like look at her on this quirky TV show, you know? Right. And then she gets another Grammy win. It's no big deal. It's just no big deal because they're like, we have to, we, we never gave a Grammy to cabaret because previously Grammys were not, uh, sorry, cast recordings were not allowed to be up for Grammys. Right. right now that's all changed. Obviously we know Hamilton, hello, won the Grammy. Several other cast albums have won Grammys as well. And so she retrospectively wins for the soundtrack to Cabaret the Movie. 
right. which is crazy. And then she goes off and does Liza at the palace, which is quite possibly one of the most famous things she's ever done. Um, and is just doing her show on Broadway, which gets her a Tony and a Grammy nomination, a Tony win, sorry, and a Grammy nomination. And if you go back and watch our first ever after the bows, you get to hear all about Liza at the palace with Cortez Alexander. Right. <laughs> and those stories are spectacular and really you should go back and watch it. Cause you have to go back and watch his it. stories are great. And I can't wait till COVID is over and we can get drinks and I get to learn more. Um, oh my goodness. I get to hear so much more, but the, here's the thing, like all of this to say, right. Liza has, she has made her own brand of herself and I think there's a reason that she has become who she is in pop culture. I mean, drag drag queens impersonate her. Ladies impersonate her. I I mean, everybody does Eliza, right? Like we mentioned at the top of this, how I've been compared to her, right? And it's because she has created her own type within right. history, um, which is rare. That's not, that's not, something that just happens right that happens over time and with legacy and with hard work and the willingness to as we've demonstrated to just take take things just say yes and see what happens well and you know what's crazy fact about liza is that i think she might be the only one don't quote me on this but i'm pretty sure that this is true i think she's the only child of Oscar winning parents to actually have two Oscar winning parents to have their own Oscar themselves. And oh, wow. I would, I would say at this point, yes, we know she's Judy Garland's daughter. We know she's Vincent Minnelli's daughter. She is her own. I mean, there are no yeah. comparisons. All three of them are, are like legitimate celebrities, icons, legends in their own right. Like that's rare. That is rare, rare thing. Yeah, it is. And I, I think there's something to be said for someone who has brought so much joy and inspiration. I mean, you talked about um, with me before about how Meryl Streep used to call on inspiration from Liza when she used to watch her on Broadway at the beginning right. of her career, right? And right, we see yeah. that in the prom. Oh, gosh. Well, yeah. So Meryl was a Broadway star or working on Broadway. I wouldn't even say a star back in the 70s. And um, she used to go watch up in the very top seats because she didn't have a lot of money. She would go watch Liza on Broadway. And she, um, what she loved about watching Liza is that not only she was a fantastic actress, but when you watch her, it's not only that, but she's she's literally speaking to everybody in the audience, mm -hmm. you know? she is in the moment behind the fourth wall, but her performance transcends it. And she, you know, Meryl went to Yale drama school. So she's like, they don't teach that at Yale. They don't teach that it factor that Liza had, you know, that she got to experience. Yale couldn't give that to her. Liza had to give that to her, which is really awesome. And that, I think that that is the highest form of flattery. Right. To take from the best, right? Absolutely. Well, guys, I think this was a fantastic discussion about our idol, Liza Minnelli. And Liza, we hope you have an awesome birthday in a couple of weeks because you turn in 74. 75. Sorry, 75. You are 74. 74. She is Good. 74. But look, we love you and we're so happy that you're still around, still making art, still doing the thing. All right, everybody. I think that wraps up this edition of After the Bounds. Absolutely. So be sure to check out all of our socials at my favorite flop. Uh, starting tomorrow, we're doing clues for episode five, which is yes, super exciting. Are. Episode five of the podcast is released next Tuesday, um, but the clues start tomorrow. So make sure to check out the socials um, yes. and DM us your guesses. Don't post them in the comments. Let us know because we don't want to spoil the fun for anybody else. We love to hear from you. We love it. And also subscribe on Apple Podcasts at My Favorite Flop. Uh, and please, if you like us, leave us a five-star review. And if you hate us, well, then the podcast name is Out for Blood. 
I mean, but in all seriousness, they're our buddies. You know, when we started our socials, they're one of the first people to the actually first. reach out and start talking to us. Yeah. Um, we've been thoroughly enjoying Out for Blood. You know, we're my favorite flop, and they're talking about one of the biggest flops in Broadway history. So, well, and Bobby's favorite flop, quite literally. I mean, I'm not jaded that I'm not on their podcast, but uh, <laughs> they recorded it all last year. It's fine. Uh, but check them out. Leave them a five-star review and then leave us one too, you know? You can leave yeah. It now, be sure to tune in in two weeks for our next episode of After the Bows, which will be another continuation of the conversation from My Favorite Flop. And we're, we can't wait to see you guys next week for episode five. Five. Okay. Bye. Bye.